Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Federalist Society virtual event. My name is Sam Fenler, and I'm an assistant director of practice groups with the Federalist Society. Today, we're excited to host Higher Ed and DEI featuring Ilya Shapiro and Professor Todd Clark. Ilya Shapiro is a senior fellow and director of constitutional studies at the Manhattan Institute. He has previously served as executive director and senior lecturer at the Georgetown Center for the Constitution. As vice president of the Cato Institute, director of Cato's Robert A. Levy Center for Constitutional Studies, and as publisher of the Cato Supreme Court Review. Professor Todd Clark is Associate Dean of Academic Affairs and Professor of Law at St. Thomas University Benjamin L. Crump College of Law. Before St. Thomas, Professor Clark was Professor of Law at North Carolina Central University School of Law, where he taught business associations, contracts, corporate justice, employment discrimination, and hip-hop law and justice. Professor Clark is also preparing to take over as Dean of Delaware Law School, and we congratulate him on his new position. Our moderator today is Devin Westhill. Devin is President and General Counsel of the Center for Equal Opportunity. He was formerly the top civil rights official at the U.S. Department of Agriculture under President Trump. Devin's writings have been featured in SCOTUS blog, The Wall Street Journal, and other publications, and he is a veteran of the United States Navy. Full bios for each of our participants today can be viewed on our website, fedsoc.org. After our speakers give their opening remarks, we will turn to you, the audience, for questions. If you have a question, please place it into the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window, and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. Finally, I'll note that, as always, all expressions of opinion today are those of our guest speakers, not the Federalist Society. With that, Devin, thank you very much for joining us today, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that introduction uh, to a topic that I'm very, very eager to talk about today. Uh, it's one that I've been following for some time, uh, and I think a lot of us have had no choice but to follow for the last several years, uh, specifically um, you know, after the, the murder of George Floyd uh, several years ago when I was serving at the Agriculture Department um, as a Deputy Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights uh, that rocked this nation. And since then, we've seen an explosion of diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts uh, around the country, not just in higher education, um, but in corporate America and many other areas uh, as well. Um, we've not only seen that explosion, uh, we've seen a, a pretty big backlash to that as well. I was at an event recently where uh, my governor, I live in the state of Florida, uh, my governor, Governor DeSantis, uh, uh, remarked that uh, we, the state of Florida, uh, was going to eliminate DEI from our public universities uh, because it, quote, stands for discrimination, exclusion, and indoctrination. Um, He's backed that threat up uh, recently. Uh, breaking news, just earlier this week, he signed into law Senate Bill 266 uh, that uh, defunds DEI efforts at state and college universities in, uh, in addition to a number of other uh, measures as well. Uh, West Virginia is another state that has uh, advanced uh, uh, similar legislation, Texas as well, and there are others. Um, individuals who have been against um, what I call big DEI, um, which is now a, um, I think by some estimates, a billion dollar industry in the United States, uh, multi-billion globally, uh, say that it's ideological. In practice, it can be illegal, immoral, uh, it's political, uh, and in many ways it's activist as well. Uh, individuals who advocate for DEI, though, um, aggressively say that uh, it really does improve student well-being when we're talking about the, uh, the higher education context. Um, the North Carolina Solicitor General um, argued um, in the Harvard and UNC cases at the affirmative uh, uh, and, and um, uh, challenging affirmative action at the University of North Carolina argued that uh, it creates, quote, a deeper, richer learning environment is what diversity does. Um, the Solicitor General of the United States, uh, Elizabeth Prelegar, uh, argued that diversity, quote, promotes cross-racial understanding. Uh, so there, there are individuals on both sides of this debate. 
Uh, and there are a lot of people in the middle as well who think that diversity, equity, inclusion efforts are good. Uh, sometimes are not done well, but largely um, are, are beneficial. And so long as we take a scalpel to this, um, that, that uh, we'll be better off by having some of it and, and not other uh, aspects of it. Uh, we see that right now in some efforts to append uh, the, the term and the idea of belonging to diversity, equity, and inclusion. There's a New York Times piece on this uh, just yesterday or the day before uh, that I read. But in any event, however you feel, it's undeniable that DEI in the last several years especially has gotten really big. Um, I've seen some estimates uh, also uh, that, that say that prominent schools um, have more DEI administrators than tenured professors of history. And is that a problem? So we're gonna explore that with our speakers today um, and a number of other really uh, important questions I hope the audience will have uh, for our, our speakers. I'll be monitoring that in the chat function or the Q&A function. So uh, please put your, your thoughts there. I'm going to have some um, really hard uh, softball questions for them uh, after they give their presentations. Um, and then we'll we'll go to audience Q&A. But with that, I'm not sure who wants to speak first. We actually didn't discuss this, um, but P Professor Clark, would you like to speak first? I was going to recommend Ilya. Okay. Are you okay with that, Ilya? I'm fine. I'm fine going first. Thanks for that. Thanks for that measured and uh, substantive uh, introduction of us and of the discussion. Um, Governor DeSantis actually based his legislation or the Florida legislature did on model legislation that Chris Rufo and I uh, developed along with Matt Beinberg of the Goldwater Institute. So I'm proud to have a, a hand in that and just laying my cards on the table. I definitely do have positions, not that anybody who knows anything about me thinks that I'm a shrinking violet on, on anything that I'm speaking about. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, the reason that uh, Professor Clark is here is because I spoke at his institution a couple of months ago at St. Thomas, and we had a, we had a good uh, back and forth afterwards. In fact, my understanding is that his performance uh, 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 measured and, and substantive and, and uh, uh, civil uh, and thoughtful was the reason why he got hired by Delaware Law. So I'm, I'm, I was happy to provide that platform for, for Professor Clark for his professional development. Um, well, look, uh, this is this is two stories. What's going on with the the, the, the diversity industrial complex or B, big DEI, as you put it, Devin? Um, uh, you know, I've gotten to learn this both personally through my lived experience with Georgetown last year. And I kind of chuckled when Sam was introduced, introducing me because it's a laugh line now that when I ask questions at conferences, I call myself Professor Emeritus. Uh, at Georgetown. I won't go over the, the, the details of that experience last year, uh, but also that's led me to kind of uh, uh, dig deep and learn about all of this stuff. And I'm now writing a book uh, due out in February, March next year, ahead of graduation season 24, called Canceling Justice, the Illiberal Takeover of Legal Education, because that's the issue here. This is not um, a continuation or the latest uh, uh, iteration of the decades old conservative complaint about the liberal takeover of the faculty lounge, you know, going back to Berkeley in the 1960s or, or what have you. Uh, the argument goes, at least though, the argument that I attach myself to is what we're seeing now. And as you put it, it's really in the last few years, I'd say the, the, the start was uh, about 10 years ago uh, or so, and it really accelerated under COVID and, and, and after the murder of, of George Floyd. Um, we've seen uh, uh, the growth of this illiberal um, uh, ideology and enforcement uh, indoctrination uh, of a kind of a, a postmodern critical social justice, critical legal studies, um, you know, things that we thought had been left uh, theoretically, philosophically back in the, the 80s um, uh, came roaring back. Uh, and we have the confluence of, of two trends in higher education. First, the bureaucratization uh, to the point where I think it was about 15 years ago or so, around 2010, uh, plus or minus, where the number of uh, non-teaching staff started to outnumber full-time faculty at, at most institutions. So the bureaucratization of higher ed, and at the same time, the growth of this uh, diversity sector, and by which I do not mean uh, you know, lawyers and others who are there for institutions to comply with federal and state civil rights laws, Title IX, the Americans with Disabilities Act, 
um, anti-discrimination law of various kinds, uh, stuff that, you know, I was in law school 20 years ago, I was in college 25 years ago, stuff that people of my generation would recognize was already there. That's not the issue. Um, the issue is um, having these new uh, centers, uh, offices, um, energy centers in universities, and we've seen that they kind of spread their political commissars in each unit of the university, including what I'm studying and what we're familiar with here, law schools, to propagate through trainings, through diversity statements for uh, applicants to admission and, uh, and hiring, um, uh, and in other ways, imbuing a culture uh, that is antithetical to the classical university mission of truth-seeking uh, and knowledge creation and, and, and teaching, or for law schools, uh, dedication to the rule of law and the practical training uh, of lawyers to uh, maintain and manage the guardrails of our legal and political uh, institutions. You see manifestations of this uh, in the shutdowns, you know, most notably recently, Judge Kyle Duncan uh, at Stanford, but it's happened you know, at Yale several times. It happened to me at the law school formerly known as Hastings. Mr. Hastings, it turns out, has done some politically incorrect things by 21st century standards. So that school is now UC Law SF uh, in San Francisco. Um, and you see it uh, not just in, in those things that make national news, but in the way that culture uh, is promulgated to uh, law students. Um, and well, more, you know, we're focusing here with a, a federal society event on, on, on law schools. Um, you know, just like deans are very good at inculcating whatever values they care about, whether it's public service, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, inclusion, diversity, um, the students are being hit over the head with uh, these identitarian identity politics style things that go far beyond uh, the fairly innocuous and, and I would say uh, sanguine or even beneficial uh, words DEI themselves, you know, who can be against diversity, having people from different perspectives uh, provide their views so it's not groupthink. So we have the full richness of human experience uh, presented in legal arguments or, or, or what have you. Uh, or equity, uh, you know, in one sense, in the legal sense, equity is centuries old in the Anglo-American common law tradition, uh, meaning the, the, the power of courts to rule uh, in a just manner. Uh, or in the more colloquial sense, equity means fairness. And, you know, I have uh, I have four little kids. Uh, two of them are just babies. I'm not sure uh, what their position is on the dormant commerce clause quite yet, but the, the five and seven year old uh, understand intuitively what fairness uh, is. And certainly we want to be fair to people. We want to treat people equally. Um, and and the, the I part, the, the inclusion, well, we want people to feel welcome, uh, whether they're at work, at school or, or otherwise. Who could, who could object to any of those things? The problem is, as those things have been defined and uh, implemented through these now vast uh, uh, bureaucracies, is in an Orwellian sense, it's the opposite of those very positive words. Uh, the D has come to be against intellectual diversity. The E, the, the, the equity, has, has rather than providing for equality under the law, equal protection as we lawyers uh, understand it, or equality of opportunity, it goes more to equality of outcome, uh, and the I, uh, rather than include, excludes uh, those who diverge from the uh, accepted uh, orthodoxy. Um, you know, don't just take it from me, you know, telling you these things from a position of authority or based on what I've seen in my research. Uh, student surveys, faculty surveys, uh, reflect uh, those uh, understandings. You know, very few people are, uh, feel free to express their views or even to broach certain topics, whether in class or extracurricularly, um, the, the, the chill, the, the, the culture, or the Overton window of the permissible range of accepted policy views has uh, shifted and, uh, and warped. And we can go into you know, possible remedies or causes of what people might be interested in, uh, but I don't think it's because you know, America as a whole or the population of students and faculty uh, have shifted in this direction. It's because of this, um, you know, public you know, economists might call it public choice analysis. The growth of these bureaucracies, with the uh, uh, the the DEI staff having an incentive to justify and grow their authority and budgets, 
you know, the demand for uh, 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 racism, say, is so great that uh, you know, outstri- far outstripping the supply, that outrages have to be manufactured and enforcement has to be taken against uh, perceived slights and, and what have you, to the point where um, you know, arguing for the law being neutral, uh, applying neutral principles to everyone, or being colorblind in how we approach uh, this or that public or private sector policy is considered to be a hallmark of uh, white supremacy. And there are equivalents with sex and gender and, and other uh, lenses in this, again, postmodern critical studies style uh, uh, intersectional analysis um, where you evaluate privilege hierarchies, engage in oppression Olympics, and thereby uh, determine whose views are most uh, important to hear from and most valid, most legitimate, uh, while others are uh, meant to go on and, uh, by definition, endless uh, hunt to atone for their group-based um, uh, uh, guilt and, and so forth based on immutable characteristics. It's nasty stuff. And I think it does a disservice to the students that are currently at institutions, and it's alarming for the future of our uh, legal and political institutions. Because after all, with the possible exception of medical schools, where the graduates are literally dealing with matters of life and death, I think it's much more worrisome uh, in law schools than anywhere else. You know, if an English department or a sociology department engages in semantic nihilism, at the end of the day, you know, who cares? Uh, but in law schools, if these are the people who are populating general counsel's offices at Fortune 500 companies uh, and corner suites in, uh, in large law firms, prosecutors' offices, uh, state legislatures, uh, you know, federal administrations, and all the rest of it, uh, and they disagree with the idea of equality of opportunity, equal protection of the law, um, uh, free speech, civil discourse. You know, a lot of this talk with DEI is, is addressed, the attack is from a free speech perspective. And that was the focus of my event uh, at St. Thomas, where, where I met uh, Dean Clark. Uh, but it goes beyond just issues of supposed clashes between speech and DEI, as Dean Jenny Martinez uh, of Stanford addressed in her excellent letter um, uh, following the shutdown of Kyle Duncan. Now, I have some qualms with certain actions at Stanford, you know, rather than punishing the, the disruptors, there's collective punishment and, and all of that. Uh, but uh, as an exposition of views, I thought that was, uh, that was perfectly uh, uh, good. But it goes beyond speech. It goes beyond threats to um, uh, basic foundational principles of our system of government and rule of law, uh, uh, equal protection, uh, 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 individual rights, due process in terms of how people are investigated. There was just a piece in the Wall Street Journal last week from an Ohio Northern professor who far from, you know, we can be up in arms about what he might be investigated or, or prosecuted or dismissed for. He doesn't even know because it's this kafka thing where they, they marched him into the dean's office and demanded that he's signed severance papers and they're not going to tell him uh, uh, why. Uh, all of this is under threat from a system that, again, you look back to these readings from the from the crits, what are called in the 70s and 80s and, and early 90s, uh, about structures and systems being fundamentally illegitimate and, and racist uh, and needing to be uh, completely torn down uh, and rebuilt. It's a revolutionary idea, which we can certainly you know, discuss and debate in the prototypical collegiate bull sessions, uh, uh, as it were. But when it's institutionalized, when it's operationalized, when it's imposed uh, by governments, but also by private entities that are educating the next generation of legal leaders, uh, I think this is um, very dangerous. And I'll end with, on a slightly more optimistic note, if you had talked to me six months ago, I would have ended just right there. Uh, but um, I think there are green shoots. I think there is some room, if not for optimism, but less pessimism. Um, because we have seen in this pushback both at a state legislative level. My governor, uh, Youngkin in Virginia, also in, in appointing a, uh, uh, his head of DEI, there's a state legislated position, the, the, the state head of, of DEI has promised to, uh, who happens to be a black man, but he's promised to dismantle uh, uh, that, those structures uh, in, in, in Virginia. Uh, whenever uh, these, uh, uh, what I consider to be illiberal practices, uh, hiring based on diversity statements, say, rather than expertise in the subject matter. Whenever they're revealed, uh, sunshine is, is shone on them, for example, or other exogenous shocks 
bar associations are going to be evaluating whether law students have disrupted uh, meetings and, and such. Uh, judges are not hiring from Yale and Stanford. Uh, I think there's 14 federal judges led by Jim Ho and Lisa Branch um, because of those schools' uh, illiberal policies. Uh, those sorts of things are starting to shift uh, uh, attitudes. And you know, sometimes all it takes is one op-ed uh, and the next day, the president of the university, as happened in Texas Tech, said, no, no, we are not going to be hiring based on diversity statements. That's inappropriate. So I do have some reason uh, for uh, less uh, pessimism, but the battle uh, has certainly been joined, uh, even if there's still a long way before universities go back to their missions of seeking truth and knowledge and law schools uh, return to their goal of um, uh, uh, teaching future lawyers to uphold the rule of law. Thank you so much, Ilya. That was a lot to chew on. Um, I've got some thoughts uh, in response to that, but I suspect Professor Clark has uh, much smarter thoughts than me. So uh, I think we ought to give him an opportunity to uh, give his opening remarks, and then um, and then we'll get into some of those really smart thoughts. Professor Clark, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, so the first thing I want to say is I want to really uh, extend my gratitude and thanks and appreciation to the Federalist Society for putting this really important discussion together. Um, I also want to uh, thank Ilya. Um, he and I, as he mentioned, uh, we had an opportunity to meet. Um, uh, I will not say that he contributed to my professional development, but he did create to a wonderful conversation and dialogue that we shared together. Um, and let me just give you a little bit of background about who I am. He mentioned about why I have an opportunity to be the next dean at Delaware Law School. And part of the reason that I have this wonderful opportunity in front of me is because during my conversation, uh, Delaware Law School is really focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And as I mentioned to them, and as I consistently seeing anytime I have an opportunity to speak, there are some people that wear a blanket or a cloak of diversity, equity, and inclusion. DEI is woven into the fabric of who I am as a person. Um, and so those things are really important to me. And I'm going to talk a little bit about why that is. I think but one of the things that I think people have mentioned, um, you constantly hear about this idea that diversity, equity, and inclusion gained increased importance um, after the death of uh, or the murder of George Floyd. And I actually will push back against that. I think that when you're talking about marginalized communities, when you're talking about underrepresented populations, African-Americans, people of color, women, these issues have been important and they continue to be important. Maybe George Floyd's death brought those to the attention of the masses, but those were issues they never lost their voice. They never lost the energy. They never lost the steam. And so I think sometimes to say that it began at that point um, is, is a bit um, is a bit of a misnomer to the extent that maybe it helped to amplify those concerns that can, were important for those groups. Maybe that might be a fair statement. But I also think before we start talking about DEI as it exists today, I think we need to talk about why diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives were initiated and created. I mean, if you think about um, America and you think about just focusing on the educational institutions, African-Americans, people of color, LGBTQ um, um, members were traditionally excluded from having a meaningful opportunity to earn a degree in America, to pursue the American dream. And so you, it really didn't come around until the, if you think about late 50s, early 60s, where many of these initiatives began to gain steam. And the reason that they gained steam was because it was an opportunity to give these new faces in higher education an opportunity not just to enter into the institution, but to enter the institution, learn and thrive, and then really graduate to give them an opportunity to capture the American dream. And so that is really, really important. And if you think about who were those individuals that were making those decisions, they were not representative of the diversity that we see now um, in our colleges and universities and in the level of success that we're having because of these DEI-based um, uh, uh, programs. Now, the one thing that the other thing I will also want to sort of highlight is diversity, equity, and inclusion um, and critical race theory. And I, I would have to sincerely disagree with, uh, with, with Ilya. One of the things that he said is critical race theory and diversity, equity, and inclusion focuses on this idea about whose views are important. 
tell you a little bit about my background. I am a critical race theory scholar. I've created a number of courses around those areas, a course called Corporate Justice that looks at issues of gender inequality in the context of the corporate boardroom, as well as hip hop law and social justice, which sort of is a lens to deconstruct um, systems of oppression um, in, our, um, in, 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 in the law. And so this is an area that I write in and never is it about whose voices are important. Critical race theory and DEI is about giving marginalized people an opportunity to, to engage in a discussion and giving them the tools that they can use. It's a lens to evaluate things as they are and to, and to really figure out why are things the way that they are? What are the things that are causing these problems so that we can reverse engineer it in order to make the world a better place, not just for people of, of diverse backgrounds, but for all people. And that's what critical race theory is about. It is not about saying, one person's views are louder than another. And I do want to keep my remarks short because I want to make sure that here are wonderful questions and allow you to kind of take over, Devon. But I do think that there is a critical confusion that is happening in America today. And I think that one of the things when I listen to Ilya speak, he talked about some of the quote unquote evils of diversity, equity and inclusion and, 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 and pushing people out and pro prohibiting people from having a conversation or elevating voices over the other. And diversity, equity and inclusion is not about that. I do think that what is happening is some of the things that you're seeing, like some of the frustrations that um, that that Ilya might be, might be referencing, are more uh, are more attributed to the generation, right? Well, I think the current generation is a generation alpha. I think that there are consistencies and characteristics of each generation um, that we have in the United States, and I think some of those frustrations about I want things now, it has to be my way. Um, in the way that they view the world. And if they're frustrated with something, having a resolution immediately and having the power to say, I want something different. That's more of a function of sort of the generational slant as opposed to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think that if you conflate those, that creates a substantial level of confusion and distorts the value and importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Clark, thank you very much for those remarks. And, um, I think we're going to take advantage of the fact that uh, you kept them uh, rather short to to uh, get into some of our questions later. But first, Ilya, can, if can, I, like can I ask can, can sure. I ask uh, Todd one thing since since uh, I, I thought he was going to get get into this. But what I've seen is surveys that uh, even on its own terms, DEI is failing in the sense of making students feel more uh, included uh, uh, and welcome and comfortable with diversity. It seems through campus climate surveys, and, and please uh, uh, educate me, and I'd be happy to take materials if you have something that, that contradicts this, but it, but it seems like tensions uh, on campus are higher. Students, whether uh, members of racial minorities or, or not, uh, feel less comfortable. Uh, and part of this might be lingering hangover from, from the pandemic, although some of these studies are from before the pandemic. And it's, so it, it just seems that you know whatever the ills might be that I pointed out, on its own terms, it seems like DEI is uh, is failing. You know, I would I would disagree with that. I mean, if you if you talk about and I could talk about my anecdotal observations from my my time as a law professor at North Carolina Central, my time as a law professor at St. Thomas and visiting and teaching at other institutions. What I have found is that these DEI based initiatives and in providing a safe in providing a space for everyone to engage in robust conversation that has really enhanced the quality of the legal education. If you think about when I was in law school and I, I go back to that time, you know, there was a I was in a, when I was at the University of Pittsburgh, we had 270 students in our class. And out of the 270 students, we had about eight African-American students at the at the school. And that was a very it wasn't as welcoming of an environment. You know, if you're one of one of, you know, eight African-Americans walking into the class and I had wonderful professors and it was a wonderful experience. But there were challenges in, ha in believing that you had an opportunity to have a voice in the classroom. DEI is about pulling those voices out. So the studies that you're citing to say that it's it's failing, my experience has been completely contrary, and it's giving people a, a voice. And in fact, honestly, in my classrooms, and I can only talk about my class, I'll, I'll share a, a story. 
uh, in my corporate justice, uh, uh, the, the corporate justice class that I teach, uh, when I taught it at a, uh, uh, it was a, um, it was a historically black law school where I created the class and where I taught it. And one of the things about that particular class, we had a lot of robust discussions about board members and um, and decision making and how those decisions are made and who they influence and who they impact. And without getting into the details, at one point. Um, the students there were a very strong liberal group, right? And so they hadn't really encountered a strong conservative perspective. And so as in my role, I had to take on that hat. And so one of the most interesting compliments that I've ever see, received is a student said um, after class one day, in the most respectful way possible, said, Professor Clark, you're like a white CEO. And, and what the student was really pressing me on was the fact that I took taken a conservative viewpoint. Student could never figure out where I was, but my role as the professor were to help students understand at the highest level. And I think that diversity, equity, and inclusion is about bringing those voices into the classroom. I, I, if you haven't been a member of a minority group in that type of room um, where, where you're one of many, it is so important to have faculty members and professors in an environment that is able to give you the comfort and the, and the confidence to speak out and to believe that the things that you've experienced in your life are of value. So I would say my observations have been contrary to the information that you are, are, are referencing. Very interesting question, Ilya, and, and, and great response, Professor Clark. And I have a question that I'd like to pose to the two of you, or at least uh, maybe an observation that um, I'd like to get your response uh, to based on some things that Professor Clark uh, just said in my own experience. So um, first of all, I think the smallest minority on, on the planet is the individual. And so anyone can feel sort of out of place given their own experiences, their own thoughts and views on things, um, and not necessarily because they are a member of any particular group. And so I wonder how DEI actually addresses the fact that each individual is an individual and different from every other person on the planet or that has ever existed. Um, when I was in the previous administration, I served as the uh, Labor Department's liaison to the White House on historically black colleges and universities and thinking about ways in which the administration might support the efforts of these uh, uniquely American institutions, which I, I care for quite a bit uh, as a racial minority myself. Um, I'm curious because from what I understand, the vast majority of HBCUs do not have diversity, equity, and inclusion departments, or if they do, they're nowhere near the size of a lot of institutions around the country um, um, that do have these uh, very robust uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, departments. Why do you think that's the case if we need to have, for example, Professor Clark, um, a difference of perspective, for example, that will help those students and that if diversity is this really uh, important thing, um, that it's not it's not available to uh, historically black college colleges and university students. Um, and I guess that kind of gets to what is diversity and equity inclusion to begin with? Does it doesn't include, for example, diversity of opinion that might help uh, the students that you were you were referencing in, in your previous class? Yeah, I think it I think it cuts across all of those things. If you're talking about what is diversity, equity, inclusion, I think you have this idea of worldview diversity, right? Which is the fact that you have these diverse perspectives that are in the classroom. I think you also have to think about diversity from the from the perspective of gender diversity, from racial diversity. I think it's about the from for me, right? The way that I see diversity, diversity is about empowerment. It's about empowering those voices in the room to have robust discussion and dialogue so that you could come to the most efficient and highest quality resolution of whatever problem that you're grappling with. That's what diversity is about. And the reason that the DEI programs were so important is because that wasn't happening. You had a large number of individuals that one, weren't able to enter into higher education, but then once they were in, in higher education, the environments were extremely hostile. And so diversity, equity, inclusion was an opportunity to level the playing field for those groups. And it's continuing to have an impact um, and positively impact those groups. Now, you asked another piece of a question, which is, you know, at HBCUs, part of it is, it, it, I think that uh, one of the reasons that you may see, uh, and, and I, ha I can't say, because um, uh, I've never looked at this information specifically, but uh, assuming that your information is correct, part of it is 
HBCUs, that's within the fabric of who they are, right? Like, I mean, HBCUs were were the institutions that were created because minority students didn't have an opportunity at predominantly white institutions. So their existence is all about inclusion. And so I think that that's that's part that's part of the reason that you you may not see it because those principles are built into the fabric of the institution itself, such that you don't need an independent office that is focused on those, on those initiatives. It seems to me, uh, I don't think I have anything specific to say to your question, uh, Devin, but it seems to me that in all of uh, Dean Clark's presentation, uh, we might be talking past each other a little bit in that his focus seems to be in the traditional affirmative action style, you know, the debate that's at the Supreme Court right now, or, you know, opportunities for people that didn't have them before. That's obviously a very important discussion. Um, to me, it's, you know, it's different. It's it's become necessarily part of the DEI discussion because DEI offices are in charge of affirmative action as well. Uh, but that, unlike how I opened, is a continuation of the decades old discussion of you know, how do we deal with uh, underrepresentation or historical um, uh, 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 disadvantage and, 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 and you know, structural uh, con lingering concerns about uh, racism and sexism and, and, and all these other prejudices and things like that. We can talk about that uh, and we can talk about how, you know, DI offices might change after the Supreme Court uh, comes down with its ruling in the next six weeks or what have you. Uh, but um, what 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 I've focused on is the the way in which I think this discussion is different than simply a forum like this, a debate on affirmative action would have been ten years ago when FedStock would have hosted it, other than not being on Zoom, I suppose. But um, and that is that this this it's a it's a step change, it's a difference of kind with this postmodern ideology that's in place that's uh, uh, about certain cultures and values and um, the trainings the the emphasis on your experience with, you know, being underprivileged and how that affects your view of the law and things like this. It's, it's a more viewpoint, viewpoint based thing, a more ideological thing. Um, and, you know, we can discuss how much it's, you know, bad or, or good, but it, that is what, what I mean by the perniciousness of DEI. It's, you know, part of that certainly is the continuing use of racial preferences and the role of affirmative action on campus and, 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 and what have you. But, that's not, um, uh, you know, that that that's not so much what these the, the explosion in DEI over the last five or ten years has done. We've had affirmative action. You know, ironically, the the whole diversity industrial complex is probably grown out of that one vote by Lewis Powell in 1978 in the Bakke case. And so we've had to structure everything through diversity rather than remedying past wrongs and debating it that way and and, and things like that. Uh, but it's this more ideological growth rather than thinking about how to provide access to underprivileged or, or underrepresented minorities. That is what most concerns me. So Ilya, when you say ideological growth, I mean, can you give me a little bit more context or give me an, an example of that? Are you talking about teaching uh, critical race theory in the context of a classroom? Like what is the evil that, that, that you are attacking? Because I think that's may maybe what I'm missing a little bit. Right, right. No, um, uh, I think that's also a separate discussion of what is taught, what classes are approved and what is said in them and our faculty indoctrinating. That's a separate question to my mind than this issue with, you know, obviously DeSantis in Florida is attacking everything everywhere all the time. But my focus is on the, the structures and the systems and the processes, whether in hiring or admissions, uh, whether the the, bureauc the bureaucratic offices that, you know, at, at, at Yale will interrogate students if they send an email that's not phrased correctly and threaten them with bar consequences. I mean, we have all of these examples of uh, whether it's microaggressions and uh, trainings given to incoming 1Ls or repeated, repeated emails from the Dean suite about the values that we undertake and the social justice cause and things like this. So, OK, that that helps a little bit. And but I and, and I think that I think I did mention speak to that because that's where I think that uh, there, there there is a sort of a connection that I think you might be making that is not a that is, is an unfair connection, because I think that you're connecting diversity, equity and inclusion to sort of just the uh, just the generational tone of America. Right. Like the, the current generation and how they interact and how they process. So, for example, if you think about 
um, issues about mental health, right? That is something that is new. That is a discussion that we hear you know, across the country, right? Like it's probably, I've heard that it's the number one issue facing America, especially after COVID. And so when you're talking about mental health, there's a lot of communication and dialogue about explaining to people the value of mental health and how it's important, how you need to assess it and create institutions to deal with it. I think some of the things that you are attributing to DEI are not, it's not based upon DEI. It's about the way that the world has changed and the way that that people have changed and the way that we deal with problems. And I don't see those two as one of the same. Those two things are separate to me. And I think you see them as the same. Well, I mean, I, I think you and I can find common ground in that indeed some of this might be uh, boomers versus uh, millennials thing and, and us Gen Xers are caught in the crossfire. But, um, you know, it's, it's interesting that you raise the, the mental health uh, issue. I mean, certainly the advent of social media and and how you know that affects uh, young people. That that's that's been concomitant with this development of uh, you know America's racial reckoning and all the rest of it in the last in the last decade. So it's hard to separate out. Uh, how that affects youth attitudes and what they're bringing to the table when they enter uh, in these institutions and now younger faculty uh, as well. But the mental health side also is paired into DEI because of the way that terms like harassment and discrimination are um, therapized. They're kind of borrowed understandings from cognitive behavioral therapy, as uh, Greg Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt wrote about in The Coddling of the American Mind. Those, those trends have even have accelerated through, through COVID. Uh, the, the idea of, of harm and what does harm mean and safe spaces, that kind of verbiage about uh, 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 mental health where um, you know, even the idea of being presented with 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 ideas or views that challenge your preconceptions that that's that's not safe or it's um, it might be dangerous in some way, whether from faculty or guest speakers. That aspect certainly, you know, so you know, mental health broadly, but specifically DEI. Part of the DEI part of the problem with DEI is that it's imputed these concepts from uh, the the psychological world. I think to uh, make make issues problematic that previously weren't. And that that's a generational thing just in terms of chronology. But I don't think it's just because, well, I'm being a little bit of a fuddy-duddy and not understanding how the kids these days are, you know, brought up. Just like that, we've got about 15 minutes left in our program. Can you believe it? I mean, I, I told you this wow. was going to be <laughs> right? And that it was going to go pretty fast. Um, um, what I'm going to do is just ask one additional question of, of each of you, somewhat related. And then I'm going to get into uh, the questions from the audience, which uh, many of them I think are very fantastic and, and I like to get to them quickly. Uh, it sounds to me, as, as Ilya just suggested, there is quite a bit of overlap here in what we might uh, term sort of true diversity, true inclusion, um, but that in some ways or other, um, the way in which it's practiced by big DEI has gone off the rails uh, in Ilya's view, I think, uh, quite substantially. Uh, Professor Clark, I think you've got potentially some uh, some grievance as well with how DEI might be uh, done today if we were to get down to brass tacks of the way in which it's practiced uh, you know, on, on the ground. Um, but Ilya, um, I've read your model legislation. Uh, I see what uh, my governor has done in the state of Florida and some other efforts around the country. Uh, it looks like, you know, the idea is, well, because we have problems with DEI, we should smash it all to pieces instead of sort of trying to adjust it to uh, be sort of true to what we believe diversity or inclusion might entail. Um, why take that approach instead of uh, sort of uh, taking the scalpel instead of the, the sledgehammer to it? Uh, and then Professor Clark, uh, I'd like to hear from you, uh, if you don't mind, you know, are there problems at all with the way DEI is done now that you might like to see changed as well, Ilya? Yeah, I, I'd say take the sledgehammer rather than the scalpel because I think DEI, uh, as I define it, and as I said, that excludes uh, those who work on making sure there's no discrimination or outreach to you know communities that that don't have students from them or or, or whatever those kind of traditional things that, as I said, those who are of of, of my generation would would, would recognize. Um, you know, my complaint was the stuff that's really blown up in the last last ten years is because I think it's a value subtracting. Uh, institution structure. Um, I think there's no, uh, there's no, there's no good there. I, I think it 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 increases tensions. It uh, 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 prevents learning. It uh, impedes 
uh, law school missions of uh, teaching about zealous advocacy and um, kind of uh, 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 facilitate student attitudes that certain views aren't even worth hearing from or that they're dangerous. I mean, in a whole across a whole lot of, of, of you know cross sections of what law schools do. Uh, and, you know, institutions more broadly. But again, our focus here is, is law schools. I, I just don't, you know, I, I see these campus climate surveys that, you know, nobody is uh, comfortable expressing their views unless you're, you know, a, a radical leftist. Some of those feel comfortable, but that's about it. And faculty who are by any definition, you know, to the left of Bernie Sanders are uncomfortable or threatened by uh, some of these offices or, or students make complaints that are framed in DEI ways after they get a bad grade and, and there goes people's careers. So, um, you know, not to mention the other parts of my model legislation regarding eliminating diversity statements because people should be judged based on their competence to teach, not whether they're, you know, all this, all this, you know, the, 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 the um, loyalty oaths to, to, to a particular uh, ideology. So I, I just don't think there is value in big DEI, as you put it, or, you know, as I define it, the, the enforcers, the non-faculty, uh, you know, bureaucratic uh, uh, engine that is, I think, creating a lot of these uh, tensions across, whether it's speech, due process, equal opportunity, and, and the rest of it. Yeah, um, I, thank you, Ilya. I, I think, um, you know, I, I do want to respond to one of those things. And I think that for um, underrepresented populations, when you hear that, I think that's where, when you hear that type of response, and I'm saying the response about taking a sledgehammer to it, that is one of the things that's really frustrating because it seems as if whenever there is something to empower people that have traditionally been prevented from having a place at the table, that the, uh, the first inclination is to smash it. But when there are institutions or documents that prevent us from entering the space or entering the room, then the idea is let's just think about this a little bit different. Let's take a scalpel to it or let's think about it differently. And that causes a lot of frustration in of itself. And that's why diversity, equity, and inclusion, critical race theory is so important because it allows you to call out things that are inconsistent and gives people the comfort of having a space to do that. So I think that that's really important. Um, the other thing that you um, that 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 you asked me about diversity, equity, inclusion, is there something that I would want to see um, maybe changed or enhanced? You know, the first thing I, I, I think that it's very important. Diversity, equity, inclusion is hot, is important in corporate America. It's important in higher education. Um, I would like to see more institutions embrace the ideas and principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think that if you ask, what do we need to change? We do need to change the narrative to the extent that anybody is distorting the, the, the purpose of diversity, equity, and inclusion as, um, as a means of preventing people from speaking or preventing people from expressing their viewpoint. That is not what diversity, equity, and inclusion is, is, is about. It is about inclusion and it is about creating opportunities for the discussion, for the dialogue. So if there was one thing I would change, that's what I would change about DEI. So do you agree with the formulation of DEI as it relates at least to free speech and, and the training of lawyers in uh, Dean Martinez's letter? What, what, what do you mean by that, Ilya? Well, she, she talks about how to uh, do DEI properly and well, we have to respect uh, um, you know, uh, different people's views. We're not going to take institutional positions on controversies, endorsing the Calvin report from Chicago, endorsing the Chicago free speech principles uh, and saying our commitment to diversity and equity does not is not uh, harmed by maintaining those classical uh, 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 commitments. And in fact, is is only enhanced uh, because it allows everyone to go about um, well, I'm, I'm paraphrasing to, to go about these goals in, yep. in, in good faith. I'm sure you've read the letter at, at least once. So my, my position is sometimes this this idea to remain neutral. I think that that's a term that people like to put on their actions, but oftentimes remaining neutral is making a selection. Right. So one of the things that you do is if you eliminate diversity, equity and inclusion, you eliminate a voice and you elevate another. That is a that 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 is a. That is exactly what will happen. And then you end up with a situation where you have a group of people that are completely excluded from the process. And now when you do that, you ultimately end up 
sort of swinging the pendulum. I think diversity, equity, and inclusion, from my experience and my research, actually is leveling the playing field in pro- allowing more people into the room to engage in the discussion. So um, I, I, I do think that um, there is a value in having all of the discussions in diversity, equity, and inclusion is the tool that is allowing marginalized groups to, to have some semblance of fairness, equity in the context of the discussion. Thank you very much for that. I'm going to give the balance of the time to our audience uh, questions. Um, I've got a few here queued up. I'd like to present to you the first, I think, relates to something that we've been uh, sort of nibbling around uh, on, on the edges of um Ilya mentioned that there's some similarity here to the concerns that are raised um, from a policy standpoint and others in the Supreme Court cases right now challenging Harvard and universities race preferences in their um, in their admissions. Um, One question is, do you think that diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives have helped empower minorities like Asians, specifically Asians? Or do you think that it's hurt them, especially first generation immigrants? Uh, and how does the DEI establishment view these minorities who also bring intellectual diversity to the table? Now, Professor Clark, uh, you also mentioned that you think you know diversity, equity, inclusion is important because of the history of this country. Um, I don't know exactly what you were referencing there. I mean, I can think of a few different uh, reasons why Asian Americans may be included in that history. Um, but uh, do, do uh, either one of you want to start in kind of responding to this? Does DEI help empower minorities like Asians? I, w- I would say yes. I mean, that is now this is this is the thing that's really interesting about DEI. And it's it's sometimes it's kind of hard to sort of look at it as like as a whole. Um, it, it really goes back to something that you said, Devon, when you talked about um, individuals. Right. I think that each individual institution has to sort of prioritize, w- make an assessment about what it needs to do to create a more inclusive culture, right? And I think that you have to take inventory of who are the voices in the room, who are the people sitting in the room, who is empowered to speak, who is who are you admitting? And I think that you have to create a plan that works for your institution. And so I think that, um, I, I, so if, if the question is, do Asians, Amer- Asian Americans fit into that to this idea of diversity, equity, and inclusion? Absolutely. Um, I can think of a place like my current law school, St. Thomas University, Benjamin L. Crump College of Law. Uh, one of the things, if, if I'm you know, on the admissions committee, I would want to do a, a wonderful, active job of recruiting more Asian American students to the law school because we don't have a meaningful population of Asian American students. And that's a perspective that would be value, valuable to the classroom. And so at our school, at St. Thomas, that would be really important. So to answer the question, would that be a part of it? Absolutely, right? But I do think you have to take inventory of your institution and it isn't a one size fits all, right? It's about sort of making sure that there is a meaningful population and a meaningful discussion and a meaningful opportunity. The way that the diversity industrial complex defines privilege and who's underrepresented and who's dis- disadvantaged. Uh, a lot of these groups, whether Asians or immigrants, you know, I'm an immigrant myself, uh, those experiences aren't as uh, aren't considered uh, as uh, part of the uh, the mix. That's um, you know not you're 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 too privileged enough. You you you're 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 white adjacent or or something like that. Um, it, I mean, I, I just I think there's you don't need uh, all of this DEI infrastructure to be able to make sure you're recruiting if you're a college from you know all the high schools in your state or nationally if you're a you know an Ivy League university or what have you or if you're a law school to make sure that you're serving your your community and that's that might mean something different for St. Thomas than it does for the University of Florida, which would mean something different than it does to. Uh, you know, Yale Law School or, or my own University of Chicago. And that, that's, you know, there's flexibility to, to, to define those sorts of things. And, you know, when it's a public school, that's different than it's a private school for uh, as well. Um, but uh, I mean, some of these things, the benefits that uh, uh, Dean Clark is, is referencing, I think you don't need these new, and, you know, these are new, like, again, last five years, especially. Uh, bureaucracies and, and training implementations to um, to affect. See, I, I think so. Let's think. Let's play that out for a little bit, right? If you think about after integration, 
Um, so you think about Brown striking down Plessy. Schools are integrated. These things, like it, to say that we don't need the institution, that's where I think it gets that. That's where I think it gets a little challenging because before we had really robust DEI departments, you the law, colleges and universities were really hostile places for minorities. And I think it if you talk about success rates, if you talk about opportunities, if you talk about meaningful participation, it didn't happen. And so it didn't start happening until the DEI initiatives started to take hold and started to grow and get and get funding. So it's like if you take that away, you go back to a situation and you go back to a climate where minorities did not have an opportunity to participate in the process. And that's where it, it's Ilya, your point would make sense if things were great. Before DEI, but they were horrible. That's why DEI initiatives, they didn't just grow out of nowhere. And that's why I said it was so important to have them and why I talked about the history of DEI when I began the discussion, because they were needed. It wasn't as though when it was self-policed that administrators and institutions were doing the right thing. It's not a matter of self-policed. Uh, we've had civil rights laws on the books federally and state for quite some time. We've had uh, affirmative action programs, including the use of racial preferences from before the rise of DEI offices. So I don't think, you know, again, I, I, again, I think you have to be parsimonious in, in how you're defining your terms and uh, how I define DEI, these, these bureaucracies that have arisen in the last five, 10 years, really, not going back to Jim Crow, not going back to UC Davis's quotas in, in the Bakke case or anything like that. Um, uh, these uh, uh, have not uh, uh, helped provide access and they, they don't have much to add in the, in the uh, area of uh, recruiting that wouldn't otherwise have been done or you know, that can be done by admissions offices without having a, an associate dean or, or you know, vice provost for DEI uh, to accomplish. There are certainly worthy goals that, that you've mentioned. Um, but I think the, what, what, what I've been talking about and what I've been criticizing and the target of this legislation across the country is the, um, the stuff that actually violates those civil rights uh, understandings and hires people based on uh, either adherence to an ideology or based on immutable characteristics, uh, things like that. And that's what is negative about DEI. It's not about being more welcoming or recruiting from a wider pool. Let's jump in here with another question from the audience because I think um, it may be helpful to discussion here as well. The, the questioner basically is asking sort of from what position are we best able to empower minorities, uh, particularly uh, black minorities uh, in this country uh, where we see you know, disparities uh, and achievement that fall along racial lines? Um, um, is it from a position of basically victimhood, that there's a problem, you, you're not gonna be able to raise your voice in class and in the boardroom and you really need support from people, or is it be are we better off saying, you know, you have the ability today to do anything that you want to do and you want to take uh, advantage of that, you have the agency to make it happen, no one's gonna stand in your way because of your race or sex and uh, in this country we have laws to protect your ability to do those sorts of things. I, I'm very interested in this because uh, although I may be somewhat in the middle when it comes to this DEI uh, debate, uh, I'm interested in what DEI might be doing as a as sort of counter uh, to uh, helping um, black and brown individuals who might other fall, you know, otherwise fall um, to, to sort of the disparities that we see. I mean, we do know that, um, you know, after casting off the fetters of bondage and notwithstanding new discriminatory barriers such as black codes, um, black Americans could show that they could do a lot, right? During reconstruction, 2000 black men served in elected office. Uh, by the turn of, of uh, mid-century, uh, last century, the real median income of the Black population more than doubled uh, by 1973, uh, and the Black marriage rate was almost at parity with the white marriage rate. So something happened um, that has got us to a point where we're very concerned that we need DEI initiatives and so forth um, that we didn't have at a time where we saw perhaps one of the most explosive uh, advances in socioeconomic success in the history of, of mankind. By black Americans, why do we need DEI now? Um, um, that that potentially tells people that they're they're victims. 
I would disagree with the, the with the with the conclusion that diversity, equity, and inclusion tells people that they're victims. And I think this kind of goes back to Ilya because, in one respect, Ilya wants to, you make a distinction between sort of affirmative action and what you're calling DEI, but then sometimes it's kind of interconnected. It gets roped back in because you start talking about making hiring decisions based upon someone's status, which starts to get. So I I, I think that. I, what what, what the, the my first response is DEI does not mean um d- does I don't think that it creates a system where um where where you tell people that they can't do it um but for um this support I think that DEI is more about empowerment not necessarily saying here's a crutch the 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 the, the DEI at its highest level was about saying, hey, here's an opportunity. Let me talk to you about this opportunity. Let me talk to you about how to achieve it. There also was a value. Um, there was some really uh, highly complex quantitative study um, called the Tennessee Star Project. I think it was student teacher achievement ratio, and it was a really longitudinal study that they did. And one of the things that came out of this study was that. Um, minority students perform better in classes like science and math when there was a person of their race in the classroom. There was a value to having that diversity. And that is a really comprehensive study. And one of the things is if you're talking about who is the best, one of the things I think we have this idea that meritocracy in America is this sort of really objective uh, metric for evaluating who should or should not get an opportunity and is not as objective as one as people might like to believe. Um, And so I think that considering diversity is a valid metric to evaluating who is truly the best in a meritocracy. So um, that's how I'll respond to to, to that particular question. Look, I'm a customer. We've run over here. We've got over 100 people still on the call, though. Ilya, do you want to uh, finish up here? Um, I mean, I, I'm happy to, to to go over as long as they're interested. I don't know. I don't. I don't have any 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 hard stop. Uh, but uh, I'm a constitutional lawyer. I'm not a, a you know a a great uh, poobah of of all social socioeconomic ills or or what have you, and don't claim expertise over the full range of the human condition. And the point is, higher education is not the point, not the place where you go to to remedy all of past uh, ills or current. Uh, injustices. Um, higher education is, as I've said, the place that uh, uh, creates knowledge, teaches students, seeks truth. Law schools uh, are that from a legal perspective, and the you know the uh, teaches the next generation of guardians of the legal system and the rule of law, and 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 helps uh, seek uh, uh, justice and recompense for those who have been wronged, and and all the rest of the you know the noble mission of of a lawyer. Um, uh, that is not the place to go to, to, to remedy all of this stuff. Um, it's, it's using a, we talked about sledgehammer. It's like using a sledgehammer to, I don't know how, what the analogy would be like. It's not even overkill. It's not a sledgehammer on a fly. It's like using a, a sledgehammer to try to power a rocket or something. It's a completely inapt tool uh, for these larger sorts of concerns. Uh, and uh, two wrongs don't make a right. And for that matter, that ties into the point that Dean Clark made at the at the end. Uh, yeah, it's it's obviously hard if you're the only person who, you know, looks different in the class or has a particular perspective. You know, that immigrants face that all the time, of course, uh, uh, as well as racial minorities. Uh, but it also is, you know, studies showing um, the, the, the effect of mismatch. If you use affirmative action and racial preferences and other preferences uh, where uh, people get into uh, uh, higher uh, uh, paced or more so-called prestigious schools and members of racial minorities cluster at the bottom of academic achievement there, that doesn't do very well uh, either, whether you're talking about eventual GPAs, bar passage rates, uh, exceptions to grad schools, and, and all the rest of it. You know, that's why HBCUs, for example, uh, are, are valuable and, and why uh, affirmative action, if we're going to go there. And again, I, I wanted to focus on, on other stuff. Uh, another reason why, uh, uh, as it's been practiced, has not even been helpful for the folks that it's uh, it's meant to benefit. Thank so you so two, much. Can I say I, two I, things? I, I'm just going to hand it to Sam. 
No, let, let, it, let Todd respond. Let Todd respond. And for that matter, I yeah. mean, I don't know. And if you have a hard stop, Devin, that, that's one thing. We, we can self-moderate. I mean, there's all these questions. No, like, right, Ilya, we can do this. <laughs> I, I, can, I can go all day on this topic. I've got a lot I can talk about. I know Sam, I mean, look, Sam's the yeah. boss here when it comes to uh, No, I appreciate it, Devin. I think, I think per, perhaps it, it would be appropriate to give Professor Clark the last word. And then I'll say, I would love to put together a part two. So let's email after this. Yes, yes. Th thank you so much, Ilya. Um, I, I do want to respond to two things. You said, why not higher education? And, and my, why higher education? And my response is, why not? If we're talking about higher education in America and the importance of higher education, and I don't need to do all of the sites because I think we could all agree when you start talking about wealth in America and accomplishing the American dream, it is those that have actually gone to college and pursued additional degrees beyond the high school degree that provides the opportunity. I mean, the difference between just a high school degree and a college degree in terms of your earning potential is substantial. And so if we're talking about truly allowing people to accomplish the American dream, it has to be in higher education. And so it is really important that we have these types of discussions to allow all individuals a, a meaningful opportunity to access that dream. So to me, it has to be at the educational level in higher education where we pursue these objectives. And the second thing is when you talk about Richard Sanders' mismatch theory, I've always had a problem with that theory because to me, it just relates to a poor professor because it's almost like I can't teach these students, somebody else can do a better job. And I've just never been so limited as a professor. You know, I'm a really good professor and regardless of what students that I get in the classroom, I'm gonna help them go from essence to existence. I'm gonna help them achieve at the highest level. I think that his mismatch theory is mismatched. And there are a lot of scholars out there that have argued against it and to say that it's a really incomplete theory for evaluating uh, students, student performance um, and aligning students where they need to be. If anything, student, the university should take on the responsibility to think about how can they push themselves to be better. I think it's a lazy response for a professor to say, I'm so bad as a professor, I can't teach this group. Let them go to someone else, right? That's an admission that you're a poor professor. And for me um, and my colleagues at St. Thomas and my future colleagues at Delaware Law School, that will not be an objective. We, we, we pride ourselves on on teaching at the highest levels and bringing students along with us. Tremendous. Well, this has been a really great discussion and I wish we had more time. To the audience who is still with us, uh, it might be appropriate for you to send in some emails that I can forward along to the panelists to put some pressure on them and bring them back for a round two. Of course, I know uh, all of you on this call are very busy. So thank you very much for your time, for your expertise, Thank you, Ilya and Dean Clark, for such a well-informed and enlightening discourse. This has been great. Thank you, Devin, for facilitating. Um, and to our audience, thank all of you for joining us. We greatly appreciate your participation. Please. Dean Clark, I'd be happy to uh, do part two or just recapitulate or what have you uh, at Delaware once you get settled. Yes. That sounds Listen. great. Ilya, I'm going to hold you to that. Let's get together and, and, and make that happen. This has just been a, a great discussion. Um, and maybe we could do a, a, a larger panel, you know, um, and, and have a nice, nice, well, robust discussion. But I really appreciate this opportunity. Excellent. Well, it's, we have plenty to talk about. And uh, to our audience, please, uh, you can check out our website, fedsoc.org, or you can follow us on all major social media platforms at FedSoc to stay up to date with announcements and upcoming webinars, potentially a part two of this one right here. Thank you all once more for tuning in and we are adjourned.